Hello, everyone. We're so glad you're here for EDB Week, where we're discussing some really big issues with some really great people. Today, we're going to discuss a problem that really started to gain attention globally somewhat around this time last year. May 25th, 2020 is the date that George Floyd was murdered. That incident, George Floyd's death, was recognized as so much more than an individual act of racial violence. People around the world knew that it was part of a bigger phenomenon called systemic racism. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So we can just dive in. I'll be your facilitator today. My name is Sloan Kali Faye and I've been in the Responsible Leaders Network for almost three years now. And since I joined, I know this question has been on the minds of many people in our network when we discuss the history of racism. What is our responsibility to face it? I'll give you a little more about my background. I'm, I'm a sociologist. And a lot of my work around racial and social justice has been connected to entrepreneurship. I wrote my dissertation on Black women social entrepreneurs and in my previous position as Director of Inclusive Economies at B-Lab, I created a justice, equity, diversity, and belonging strategy for about 1,500 companies across our North American market. Now I, I consult, I write, and I do program design about racial justice and inequity. Also, I'm a cisgender Black woman, and given that that's how I move through the world, I, I have a personal connection to some of the ideas we'll explore today. So here's our agenda. We'll discuss why this conversation now. We'll also uh, get into the nuts and bolts of systemic racism, and then we'll finish by figuring out next steps. Where do we go from here? Okay, so we'll start with why now. One reason we're discussing this very important issue is because there is an international groundswell. There have been both violent and nonviolent uprisings in response to racism. And around this time last year in the United States, people had literally been risking their lives by protesting against racialized police violence, as well as others across the world. And people have been criticizing the fact that COVID deaths were more prevalent amongst people of color. People have literally been tearing down statues representing people that they see as oppressors. And what people want is self-determination. They don't want to have less power over their lives than others. And so many of us want to shape our own destinies. So whether or not that means there are, are some neighborhoods you can't go to without being discriminated against, or that you can only go to underfunded schools, or how much money you're likely to make given your level of education, now these issues go beyond interpersonal racism when we look at that broader level. So they can't really be addressed at an individual level. People are fighting for both solutions now, like mandatory racial equity training for all organizations, reparations for chattel slavery, and defunding the police. So I wanted to introduce you to a, a nonprofit organization that does some really great reporting and research on economic justice. Um, so this think tank found that in the same way uh, that there is a 2030 deadline before the point of no return for our earth, similarly, there is a ticking clock on black wealth in the United States. If changes aren't made by 2050, black Americans will have zero wealth. Also, in, in terms of why this conversation now, it is simply not sustainable for the majority population in the United States, which is people of color, to be economically disadvantaged. If most American citizens are suffering economically, the United States will also suffer. 
so now we're gonna talk a little more about systemic racism. Um, and before we begin, I wanted to just reiterate that systemic racism is different from interpersonal racism. Systemic racism requires us to zoom out and not only see what's happening within someone's individual life, someone's individual life as a racially minoritized person. And I'll just use uh, Black people as my reference here, but it's a term, um, systemic racism is a term that applies to people of all races. And the framework that I'm about to, to introduce you to can be applied to any member of any racially minoritized group. And, and just to reiterate this point about looking at the group level, when we think about an individual, we can see an individual as a tree. So I'm a tree, but I'm, I'm more than a tree if I'm, I'm a part of a forest. And racial identity is a group identity. It's something we talk about in terms of collectives as a forest rather than as an individual isolated tree. And when we're talking about systemic racism in particular, we are looking at patterns within specific racial groups, not within individual behavior. And again, collectively and in relation to other groups, also at a collective level. So this is the Domains of Power Framework it is adapted from a sociologist named Patricia Hill Collins, who defines racism as a system of power with four domains. And I'll just go ahead and read this slide for you to make sure we're digesting. So the interpersonal domain, that involves everyday interactions with people in which Blackness is devalued, vilified, and or erased. And so for example, this could include racial slurs. So someone using the N word, for example. And then cultural racism involves the vilification, minimization, co-optation, and or erasure of black culture through modes of cultural production. So this uh, largely involves media rep representation, stereotypical media representations, but this also could look like cultural domination. So for example, if in a, a work environment, um, cultural communication styles are grounded in white culture and no other cultures, that's considered cultural domination. And that can also be considered a form of cultural racism. Then there's the disciplinary domain. And this goes back to, again, the, the George Floyd protests. The disciplinary domain includes enhanced and egregious mechanisms of punishment and control for blacks relative to whites. And so in the United States, for example, the United States is the country that incarcerates more people than any other country. And most of those people who are being incarcerated are black and Latinx. And so uh, some examples of racism in the disciplinary domain includes police brutality, and over-representation over of Blacks in United States prisons. Then there's the institutional domain. And this includes institutional practices, policies, procedures, and norms that are enforced by co corporate, government, and other institutional authorities. And so again, with the institutional domain, this goes beyond individuals. Um, and so this also includes institutional authorities that produce disproportionately negative outcomes for Blacks relative to whites. And so for example, this includes voter registration res restrictions. And in the United States, uh, Washington DC, which is a majority uh, uh, people of color uh, space, and I have to say space because it's not considered a state, because Washington DC does not have statehood, black people in that area don't have access to the vote. And so because they can't vote, they have less political power than other states where white people are overrepresented. And if they did have that political power uh, to vote, they could sway uh, political decision makers to, to 
enhance laws and policies that serve them. So the image you see here of, of a parent and a child is something a lot of Black people will not know or experience as the infant mortality rate is higher and has consistently been high for Black communities as opposed to all other racial groups. So I wanted to use uh, this as an example of a social problem that affects Black people as a group and not, again, as a set of isolated individuals. So as I mentioned, the infant mortality rate for Blacks in the United States is the highest relative to all other groups. So to understand this problem, we have to look at factors that go beyond individual behavior because we're not looking at individuals. We're looking at groups. So we'd be asking ourselves, what are the external factors that these groups have in common? When it comes to infant mortality, we see that Black people are less likely to have health care overall. This is very expensive if you don't have an employer that covers it. And the unemployment rate is also high for Black Americans. It's higher than the national average in the United States. Also, if you're a mother who lives in a food desert, and a food desert is a place where there is no access to healthy foods. There are usually fast food restaurants um, and corner stores where, there, again, there are no healthy food options. So if you don't have access to healthy foods necessary to have a healthy birth, that is something that contributes to the infant mortality rate as well. Also, if you are consistently experiencing toxic stress, which is unhealthy for a fetus, and you could be experiencing that because you live in an unsafe neighborhood where you have to be hyper vigilant nearly all the time. And it's Black people who are concentrated in neighborhoods like that. So the major takeaway that is so important um, is that given that racism is systemic, our responses to racism must also be systemic. But there are still a lot of people who still think that racism only looks like calling someone the N-word or harassing someone because of their color. But as we've just learned, racism is more extensive than that. So where do we go from here? Well, I'm going to provide some sources of support, high level strategies, and how we'll need to think about success when it comes to racial justice. And I'll give an example of an organization that is working to implement these types of strategies. So the first thing we need to know is that when it comes to doing this work, justice, equity, diversity, and belonging work is inherently collaborative. You can't do this alone. And also, if you are a part of an organization that is still trying to figure out what you can do to address racism within your organization and systemic racism, you need outside support. And you need to involve people of the groups that you wanna help. And so I think this quote by Albert Einstein really sums it up well. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So some sources of support are at the individual level. And I think this is a really great resource is to get a racial equity coach, someone who can help you on your racial justice learning journey. And then zooming out, um, an organizational source of support is broader racial equity consulting. And I think it always helps to have a, a racial equity consultant go through an organization's theory of change and hiring practices. So what are some practical strategies? I'll just read a few of these, uh, but the 
but a really great resource to explore what strategies your organization can implement is PolicyLink. That's another nonprofit think tank that does really rigorous research on racial inequities. So one strategy is that you can apply the company's do no harm stance by regularly assessing national level policy positions. And this is for, for potential conflicts with the organization's racial equity commitments and negative community impacts. Also, you can engage community members and community led organizations in the formation of your federal policy agenda. Also, another step you can take is to support government led reparations. And so you can support political policies like this. And you can also, in terms of the anti black racism statements that a lot of organizations have put out, in terms of sharing how you'll be applying that anti black racism statement, in terms of how you're going to translate that into actions, supporting government led reparations is a really great approach. And you can be vocal with your position on that. Also, I, I know we just reviewed some really heavy issues. And again, these problems have been centuries in the making. And so it is easy to get discouraged when we're trying to implement strategies and progress is a bit slow. But I want you to be encouraged, but also be practical because Again, like these problems are going to take a lot to correct. So I just wanted to share progress is possible, but we must broaden our definition, our definition of success and be diligent about our commitment to succeeding. So how do we broaden that definition of success? This is a model I use in a lot of my trainings, the success triangle. Now, in most organizations, when we think of success, we think of that, that word at the top of this triangle, results. That's what we think of in, tar in terms of success. But when we're talking about social justice or racial justice issues, we need to broaden our understanding. Again, because this work takes time. And so instead of just focusing on results, we can also think about processes. What successful processes have we created to ensure that we are demonstrating our commitment to racial justice? And also in terms of relationships, I think it's always worthwhile for an organization to, to at least consider having a civic and volunteer outreach department. And again, if you are going to be advocating for racially minoritized groups, you need to be in healthy relationship with members from, that, from those communities. And you should consider the formation of those relationships a success. And so some questions you can ask yourself on your racial justice learning journey is what relationships do I commit to forming? What processes do I commit to implementing? And what results will I diligently and humbly work to create? And I really want to underscore that word humbly. I believe in radical humility when it comes to doing this work. We can't just rush in and think because we are successful as an organization, we'll definitely be successful when it comes to our racial justice efforts. I think it's really important to learn from the groups that you want to support. And again, this goes back to establishing those, those relationships and also building your own knowledge base, self-education about racial justice. And so this is an example. Unilever recently announced a wide ranging set of commitments and actions to help build a more equitable and inclusive society by raising living standards across its value chain and creating oppor opportunities through industry and inclusivity and preparing people for the future of work. Uh, um, you can learn more about this example. Uh, you will get a copy of these slides. And if you click this link, you'll learn more about all the things that Unilever is doing. I think they are a strong reference. And that's where I'll leave you for now.
Um, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. That's always my favorite part of these presentations. If you're interested in learning more about me, you can visit my website, sloankalife.com. And you can also email me. I'm always happy to talk to people who are on this journey. So you can reach me at sloan at sloankalife.com. And thank you.